Thank you very much. I invite uh, Professor Michael Coleman uh, to the podium, who will be talking about cancer survival research in, and, it, its, and its impact on cancer plans and the experience of the UK. Professor Coleman acts as Professor of Epidemiology and Vital Statistics at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and is an advisor on cancer policy and research. Please, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers very much for inviting me back. And uh, I would take an opportunity to discuss uh, the UK experience in cancer plans, not from the point of view of presenting the plans per se, but uh, in uh, speaking about the role of cancer survival research and its interaction with national cancer planning. Uh, of course, I haven't got the hang of this thing. Uh, that's the arrow. Uh, this is that's what I tried. Forward. You have a better thumb than I do, thank you. Um, so I'm going to go through these five aspects of the policy impacts of survival research. And uh, I'll take each one in turn, starting with the issue of whether we should be looking at survival or mortality. And later, if I have an opportunity, I'd like to discuss the second topic there, which is confidentiality and consent. So, hmm. Is it me? Tit, I did exactly the same as you did, and this is going nowhere. Okay, I got it. Okay. I have no experience doing this, I'm really sorry. Um, I just wanted to point out that the, the World Cancer Declaration in 2008 raised 11 goals for 2020, one of which was achieving major improvements in cancer survival worldwide and another improving the measurement of the global cancer burden of uh, one of the elements of which is of course survival. Last week in South Africa the World Cancer Declaration was updated with a single overarching goal and nine subsidiary targets and that overarching goal includes major reductions in premature deaths, improvements in the quality of life or survivorship and in cancer survival. And I guess the national policy concerns in relation to survival can be summed up in, in this way. Is it equitable between our population groups, be they socioeconomic or ethnic or other? Is survival in our country as high as elsewhere? Is our national cancer plan effective? And if not, a number of obvious subsidiary questions arise. So the first question is, should we be looking at cancer survival or indeed cancer mortality as a way of evaluating the effectiveness of our health system? And there's been a lot of argument in favor of using mortality rather than survival. So I'll put up an example from the front page of one of our leading um, newspapers, The Independent in the UK, with this um, map of the UK showing red in Scotland for high cancer mortality and paler colors down towards the south of the UK showing lower cancer mortality. And if you can possibly read it, the second headline says, how where you live determines your chances of survival. And of course, this map has nothing to do with survival. It's a map of cancer mortality. And the map is, of course, strongly affected by both incidence and mortality. That doesn't stop people suggesting we should use mortality as to evaluate the effectiveness of health systems. So let's take a look at this. Here is the downward trend in lung cancer mortality in men in England over the last 30 years or so. There is a massive downward trend replicated in many countries which represents about a 50% drop from, in fact, about 100 to about 150 in the age standardized death rate in men. In women, the picture is less favorable. It looks almost flat. It is, in fact, approximately a 7% increase over that period. And if Margaret Thatcher, Prime Minister in 1979, had seen this graph at the time, she would certainly have argued for the closure of the National Health Service on grounds of lethal sex discrimination. Of course, this graph has nothing to do with the effectiveness of the health service. If we look at the trends in incidence for men 
and in incidents for women, they of course follow the trends in mortality very closely. And it won't take a genius to work out that if you look at survival in men and in women, it's flat and exactly equal in both sexes right across this time period. In other words, the outlook for lung cancer once diagnosed has barely changed one iota in a generation for either sex in the UK. Mortality is not useful for monitoring the effectiveness of health services. So let's look at the impact of survival data as a driver for change. This is a potted history of cancer planning in the UK, and if I mention England as well, that was because during this 15 or 18 year period, health was devolved to the four member nations of the United Kingdom, and so the later parts of this sequence relate solely to England. The first report in 1995 prompted a reorganization of treatment services and it was followed a number of years later by the first appointment of a national cancer director, one of your colleagues, and then a national cancer plan, a reform strategy, and a later development of it. The national plan in 1995 noted variations in the recorded outcome of treatment across the UK and specialized care being an obvious factor in improving survival, and it recommended that all patients should have access to a uniformly high quality of care wherever they live, in other words, the regional variation, and to ensure the maximum possible cure and best quality of life. Socioeconomic inequalities in survival are evident. If we look at the difference between rich and poor or affluent on the left and deprived on the right, this is rectal cancer survival in five groups defined by depri deprivation diagnosed in the late 1980s in England and Wales. There is a clear inequality between the rich on the left and the poor on the right. And five years later, survival had gone up for everybody, but more for the rich. Five years later again, there was a huge increase in survival, and again, much more evident in the rich than the poor. And notice that I use the rich and the poor as shorthand here for socioeconomic inequalities defined on the basis of residence, and we're adjusting for differential background mortality in each of these five categories. This is not just due to the fact that the poor have higher death rates. It's due to the fact that they survive cancer worse, but even then, you can see that their cancer survival increases over time to match that of the rich just a few years later. This suggests something about the effectiveness of the health system in delivering care. If we look at international differences, red at the top is, in this case for breast cancer, five-year survival for England and Wales, is lower than the average for Europe and for the USA, and the vertical lines just beyond the red bar, the red horizontal bar, shows that no matter whether you pick the region with the best survival or the socioeconomic group with the best survival, we still didn't at that time approach the European average survival. So the perception of survival in Europe versus the rest of the UK, excuse me, in the UK versus the rest of Europe, well, it doesn't matter, it's still a comparison, is that survival in the UK was lower than in comparable countries in Europe. There were socioeconomic inequalities, delays in diagnosis, variable treatment quality, and many avoidable deaths. And the reaction of the Prime Minister at the time, Tony Blair, who called a so-called cancer summit, was to make these fairly obvious conclusions that the UK did not match other countries in prevention, diagnosis, or treatment. It wasn't good enough, and we needed to do better. He appointed a national cancer director who immediately prepared the first seriously comprehensive cancer plan in 2000 with those objectives, saving lives, ensuring the best treatment, reducing inequalities, and building for the future explicitly so that the NHS never falls behind in cancer care again. Nine years later, we were able to attempt a first evaluation of the effectiveness of that plan by looking at survival trends in England, which had a cancer plan, compared with Wales, just to the west of England, which did not have a cancer plan, but otherwise had exactly the same form of healthcare system, a kind of natural experiment. The, we were looking explicitly for changes in survival 
After the implementation of the plan, we allowed a three-year period labeled as during, don't know whether there's a pointer here, during um, the, between 2000 and 2003, after the implementation of the cancer plan um, in the first vertical line, and we measured trends after the second vertical line, looking for acceleration in the underlying cancer survival trends. And we saw such an acceleration in men, colon cancer in men, and we did not see it in whales. If that plan had been, if that pattern had been replicated for all cancers, it would have provided strong evidence of the effectiveness of the NHS cancer plan. Unfortunately, that was not the position. The trends in breast cancer survival showed no evidence of a beneficial acceleration on our prior hypothesis that there would be one after 2004. The evidence was therefore mixed. It may have been too early. If we look now at international comparisons of survival, these are data taken from an earlier Eurocare cycle. Eurocare 5 will be reported very shortly, and I certainly don't want to steal their thunder today. But if you look at the four black bars for the four UK nations, they are all significantly below the European average. If you look at these uh, trends here, the lighter blue bars, uh, the longer blue bars show the increase in survival over a decade in the Eurocare study. And three of the upper bars there for Scotland, England, and Wales, with a circle around the number at the end, show that survival has been increasing faster in countries where survival was low at the beginning. And the UK nations benefit from that trend. I've done it again. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, you got it? Thank you. I hope it isn't just me. Okay, a much more recent study of an international comparison of survival showing Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and the UK compared with Australia and Canada for four major cancers. We were able to bring together data on 2.4 million patients from cancer registries diagnosed up to 2007. The trends in survival for breast cancer are shown here. The upper traits, the solid lines, are for one-year survival. The lower traits, or dashed lines, are for five-year survival. They're each marked with a label and a color for the country, and the summary is that there is a clear difference in cancer survival for breast cancer, but it is also narrowing significantly with the UK at the bottom and Denmark next catching up against the other four countries in the study. This is clear evidence of relative improvement in survival in the UK and Denmark. If we look at two of the other can cancers here, colorectal and lung cancer, the same kind of grading is apparent in both one-year and five-year survival, and there is absolutely no evidence of any change in their relative position particularly for UK and Denmark, which remain persistently bottom of this six set, a set of six countries. That kind of information generates serious policy concern and thinking, and it raises the question of whether there are avoidable premature deaths, that is, deaths that would not occur if five-year survival were as high in the UK as it is in comparative countries such as, say, France or Italy. And if you divide the number of deaths, the blue bar on the left, the total number of deaths into those that you would expect on the basis of background death rates and the yellow block at the top, which is the number of deaths that occur as a result of the cancer patients having higher death rates because of their cancer, you can then subdivide that yellow group of the so-called excess mortality into two groups. The red block at the top is the number of deaths that we could avoid if we brought the survival in the UK up to the survival in some comparator country where it is higher. And we can measure those avoidable deaths using relative survival. 
and this graph shows the number of such avoidable deaths for a large number of cancers in, the, in Britain compared with the European average over a 15-year period. I won't go through the details. You can see that the numbers are very large. The annual numbers of avoidable deaths reaching 2,800 for breast cancer and gradually coming down and a variable pattern for other, uh, for other cancers. Overall, simply 10,000 deaths every year that occur in Britain because within five years of diagnosis, because five years survival is lower in Britain than in the, the average for Europe. That drives policy. The NHS Cancer Plan in 2011 set its sights precisely on that noting that English survival continues to lag behind the best performing countries and that if England, England not the UK, England were to achieve the European average survival, 5,000 lives would be saved every year. And a range of actions were developed to respond to this challenge, including maintaining multidisciplinary teams and focusing ca cancer care in specialised centres where that was possible and practical. One point worth raising is whether or not survival comparisons are misleading. Some very senior and experienced epidemiologists have argued that they are, and I quote directly from their editorial in the British Medical Journal three years ago, and please note that the emphasis in white italics is emphasis that I have added, and I'll use it. If the first months or years of the illness are never traced, the earliest event registered may be some aspect of cancer recurrence. The date of this recurrence would then be taken as the date from which survival is calculated, and this makes short-term survival look misleadingly worse in the UK than in countries such as Sweden. This is an editorial that goes from conjecture to conclusion without the benefit of evidence in between. It's a serious mistake. And it's important when it's this misleading because policy decisions get to be made on it. And in the Department of Health, there was an outbreak of what I would call headless chickenitis or a complete loss of nerve when this uh, editorial appeared, questioning whether, in fact, the entire cancer registration system was fit for purpose. Our approach was to simulate the errors that they recommended, uh, excuse me, that they had conjectured exist. We simulated them in the national data and showed that no matter if you assume that 70% of all cancer registrations have the date of diagnosis wrong by at least one year, you cannot close the gap between England and Sweden in breast cancer survival. There is no way that extent of error exists. Anybody who's dealt with cancer clinically or in a cancer registry will know. But there is more evidence in the citation there. We concluded with a large number of authors and experts in cancer survival and, in, and interpretation that that editorial was unfounded, untenable and inconsistent. The editor of the BMJ said the authors were too busy to defend it and we recommended that it was indefensible and should be withdrawn. And that was because it had already been used to advise the government not to depend on cancer registration in making cancer policy. The Department of Health was grateful, it turns out, for our rudeness and argued that the evidence we provided was the strongest plank they had for defending the cancer registration system. I'm sure it's not just me. Can you help me out here? Thank you. And no, I've got it. It was up there. I was referring up there. I'm really sorry, Tit. You're, you're getting very good at this. Um, I don't know what's wrong with this, or maybe it's just me. One last point on geographic variation. Can we reduce it? We looked at 2.5 million cancer patients diagnosed up to 2010 and followed up until the end of 2011. In living in each of 151 primary care trusts. These are small areas of England which collectively cover the whole country. And we were, they are the unit, or were until very recently, the unit of organization of health care in England. And we looked at one year net survival by year of diagnosis. And I'm going to present to you some smoothed maps of small area survival trends 
prepared with the help of colleagues in the Finnish Cancer Registry. And I hope you will see that they are both of local use for effectiveness and local management of cancer in terms of the underlying data. But what I want to show you is their national use for strategic surveillance. This is a map of England only England with London separated to the right of your picture because there's more going on in London. And the vertical scale from red to blue, low to high of survival shows you a north-south gradient. So survival is higher in the south than it is in the north. This is a smoothed map, but the big circles are for areas of the country where statistical smoothing is not necessary. And what I want to show you is the effect of the change in this, in this geographic pattern over time. This map is for 1996. And subsequent maps, you'll see moving through year on year how the geographic pattern of survival actually changes. And this is based on 151 small areas where the data have been smoothed to represent a national pattern. And you can see how as the time passes over the 10 or 15 years, the north-south gradient is maintained whilst survival improves everywhere. It does in fact narrow the difference between north and south, but not very much. And the gradient across London is as wide as it is across the rest of the country put together. And these maps give government ideas of how strategic control of cancer is improving or not. And the tabular data underlying these maps help individual health service managers decide where they fit in the national scheme of things. The same data can pre be presented on a funnel plot where the, um, pat the dots each represent a single primary care trust and the scatter on the vertical scale of survival is modulated by the degree of precision of the estimates. So the most precise estimates to the right, the least precise estimates to the left. Any estimates that fall inside the strange funnel shape which gives the, the plot its name are within the what you could expect by random variation. The dots above the funnel are, ex, are extremely high and the red dots below the funnel are those that are significantly below what you would expect given the size of that particular population. And so they give you an idea of where variation is beyond what you would expect by chance. And we can see how this changes with time that's in 1996, five years or six years later, average survival has increased and some of those red dots are now within the range of national variation that you could expect. And another five or six years later, the average survival has gone up further and there is even tighter patterning around the central mean showing that there is a reduction in the geographic variation in survival which I mentioned on the maps a few minutes ago. And I would summarize this by saying that the variations in cancer outcome depend on very much more than clinical expertise. They depend on rapid diagnosis, which depends in turn on wide public education and culture about our bodies and what to do when we have symptoms suggestive of disease, the stage or extent of disease at diagnosis, whether the disease differs between parts of the country or indeed between countries, which it does, whether there is equality of access to optimal treatment, and I've suggested with some of the data that is clearly not the case in the UK and there are other countries where that is also true, whether or not we're implementing best practice, in other words, following guidelines, and how we organize the services of cancer treatment, and of course, how much human and financial resource we devote to them. Those, I think, summarize the variations in cancer outcome, and I hope I've shown you that cancer survival is just one of the metrics that can be used to help guide national cancer plans. Thank you.